This time on Landmarks, the use of new materials adds fresh dimension to precious buildings. We travel to India to take part in the Hindu Harvest Festival. We look at Japanese hotels with a difference. And we visit the home and heart of tennis. But first... The central Mediterranean island of Malta is known to most Europeans as a sunny holiday destination. Its famous 40 kilometer long Grand Harbour and strategic location just south of Sicily made it a crossroad from Eastern to Western Europe and from Africa to the European mainland. Perhaps the centerpiece of Malta's many jewels is the UNESCO heritage listed St. John's Co-Cathedral in the capital Valletta. The church bears the name of the patron saint of the religious order that ruled the islands between 1530 and 1798, the Knights of St. John. The descendants of the original crusaders were generous in their donations to the church, which is home to masterworks by artists such as Caravaggio and Rubens. When a grand master was appointed, it was a, an appointment for life, but the first thing he had to do was to give a gift to St. John's. Uh, we have uh, several of them, for instance, um, the collection of Flemish tapestries, which is the largest collection in the world. That was the personal gift of Grand Master, the Portuguese Grand Master, uh, Ramon Perelios. Completed in 1577, the Co Cathedral in the surrounding fortified capital, Valletta, was financed by the nobility of Europe partly in thanks for withstanding a nine-month siege from the then all-powerful Ottoman Turks. The city had been um, founded by the Grand Master, Grand Master Lavalette, who had been victorious in the battle over um, the Ottoman Turks. And he was determined to have a city that was um, fortified and that also befitted this uh, a group of noblemen. The church was to become a Baroque masterpiece. In the 17th century, Grand Master Nicholas Cottoner decided to have the interior of St. John's um, decorated in the new Baroque style. And then subsequently, Mattia Preti prepared designs for the carvings of the walls. An interesting thing is that most churches are decorated with stucco. That means a plaster cast, which is then attached to the wall. But in Malta, it's different. In St. John's, it's different. The walls were actually carved in situ into the stone, just because the Maltese stone, Maltese limestone, lends itself so well to being carved. And then, if that wasn't enough, they actually covered them with 24 karat gold leaf, <clears throat> which unfortunately have suffer suffered from the ravages of time and now are being uh, regilded. While restoration in a building as old and rich as St. John's is an ongoing process, this is the first major restoration for over a century and possibly its most comprehensive ever. During the restoration process, some fine work has been rediscovered. The details of the crucifixion group of wooden sculptures were hidden behind centuries of dust and makeshift repairs. And the crucifixion group is um, a gift of one knight, Commander Felicaya, who on his death, a part of his inheritance was given to St. John's. And this uh, lovely group of sculptures came, arrived in Malta in 1653. Though it is yet to be confirmed, the work is likely to be attributed to one of the leading Roman sculptors of the time, Alessandro Delgadi. Once we started cleaning off the gesso, it was obvious, even from before, it was obvious that the artist was a great, great artist. There's no economizing in details, definitely. Primarily, what you immediately see a difference in are the facial features, the curls and the hair, and which is, this is very important, even the drapery, the drapery of the figures has taken a new lease of life. By the way, the 1941 Humphrey Bogart film The Maltese Falcon was based on a true story. The Knights of Malta gave King Charles V of Spain a Maltese falcon, not jewel encrusted, but a real one. Coming up, the stuff domes are made of. What do a racing yacht and a mosque dome have in common? In Malaysia, they are made of the same material, 
fiberglass and other composite materials. Mosque domes and minarets are prominent features in Malaysian cities, reflecting the Muslim majority of the Southeast Asian nation. The onion-shaped domes which grace the skyline of cities in Malaysia used to be made of concrete, bricks and sometimes even copper and steel. But now, a Malaysian-German joint venture based in the ancient port city of Malacca has started to make them out of composite materials and the lightweight yet durable domes are beginning to gain popularity, not just for use in religious architecture, but in government buildings as well. The joint venture company, Dian Creative, was set up in 1997 and utilised technology from its German parent company, Speedway, which produces racing yachts in Germany. The company has since expanded to become DK Domes, the plant in Malacca has several European engineers and Malaysian employees who make racing yachts for enthusiasts in Hong Kong and Australia. But domes are by far the company's most popular product. Innovation is a hallmark of the work. One example is the Prophet's Holy Mosque in Medina. 27 sliding domes demonstrate the successful integration of traditional wood carving craft with state-of-the-art composite materials. The mobile roof counteracts extreme temperature changes and controls and supports the air-conditioned environment of the mosque. Inner dome surfaces are richly decorated with Moroccan hand-carved ornaments and gold leaf highlights. Each dome is capped by a gold-plated finial. The architect has much more freedom to design the dome and it has much more flexibility. Uh, the materials we are using is absolutely high-tech. Um, it's epoxy, carbon fibre, glass fibre being used on any kind of aircraft. Uh, um, and the big advantage is that the material is a lot, lot lighter than uh, traditional materials like concrete, like steel. Our domes are only roughly about 15% of the weight of a concrete dome. Uh, one other big advantage is that um, our installation period is, is a lot, lot shorter. The Wilaya Mosque in Kuala Lumpur follows the form of Turkish Ottoman mosques, particularly in the overall arrangement of the domes. There are 20 outer domes and 17 inner domes. The base dome is an impressive 31 metres wide with arched windows at its base. The outer shells of the domes are finished in mosaic tiles with decorative motives and are peaked by a crescent moon finial in a gold finish. Another beautiful example is the Al Burkari Mosque in Kedah province in Malaysia. Two minarets guard the smaller half domes positioned below the main dome. The main dome is an impressive 14 metres in diameter and is decorated with Quranic calligraphy. All the domes are constructed from glass fibre epoxy resin they impressed former Malaysian Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamad. He had several domes assembled for his residence and office. Now in Malacca, we have this uh, industry that can manufacture domes in segments and then is, is able to assemble it uh, very, very quickly. And now that industry from many other countries, I think a lot of uh, people are building domes, not just for mosques, but also for buildings. And uh, this is a very good industry which has got great export potential. The new domes decorated with intricate designs are also attracting admiring glances from local Muslims. The flexibility of the new materials has given an added dimension to buildings which are regarded as precious by many people. Each January, thousands of pilgrims, worshippers and tourists make the pilgrimage to the 5,000-year-old sacred Indian city of Varanasi to take part in the Hindu harvest festival of Makara Sankranti. Varanasi is the site of possibly the most spectacular festivities on a day that is celebrated nationwide and in the fine tradition of India in unique fashion by each of the participating regions. What each celebration has in common is the great devotion, fervour and gaiety the participants bring to the day. For the pilgrims, the day begins by taking a dip in the sacred waters of the Ganges and offering water to the sun god while praying for knowledge, wisdom and enlightenment for yourself. 
It is especially popular among the youth, as according to folklore, girls who take the holy dip get handsome husbands and boys get beautiful brides. There are seven steps to correctly celebrating Makara Sankranti. Among them is the need to honour your ancestors, give some food to someone who truly deserves it, and to visit your son. There is also a need to meditate and to contemplate how to turn your prayers for the well-being of all into action and deeds. Tradition says that the holiest dip in the Ganges is on Makar Sankranti. This practice goes on. We come here year after year for spreading our religion. We believe that with the strength of the Ganges, our holy river and our mother, our country will make great progress. Makara Sankranti may be an ancient ritual, but it is taking place in a modern world. Contemporary requirements such as increased security are evident. Mine and weapon detectors were in evidence and security men frisked devotees to avoid any untoward incidents. Every possible security arrangement has been made for the festival. The local police, women's police wing, civil security, information agencies. All of these add up to more than four and a half thousand people. Fortunately, this day passed relatively smoothly and the celebrations throughout were intense. Troops of folk singers and dancers performed on the shore and on boats which plied down the river. A huge number of foreign tourists visited Varanasi to take in the spectacle and to meet the huge variety of exotic and at times mysterious locals. While it is a winter harvest festival, Makara Sankranti also marks the commencement of the sun's journey to the northern hemisphere, a time of great religious and astrological significance. In the English calendar, Makara Sankranti always falls on the same date, January 14th. The date varies under the Hindu calendar, but the purpose is the same. They consider it the date of the winter solstice, after which the days become longer and warmer. From this day begins the six-month-long Uttarayana, considered very auspicious for attaining higher worlds hereafter. The festival is known in different parts of the country by different names. While it is known as Makara Sankranti in eastern and parts of northern and northwest India, it is celebrated as Pongal in the south and as Bihu in the northeast. Ganga is the goddess of the river Ganges, India's most sacred body of water. Hindus believe that bathing in her holy waters will help wash one's sins away, and hence they conduct repeated ritualistic washings in the river to secure a place in heaven. Coming up, Japanese leisure hotels. During this series of landmarks, we've visited many of the world's best and most famous hotels, but it's true to say we have never visited any quite like these before. Japan's booming leisure hotel industry. A uh, leisure hotel is essentially just a hotel like any other, but it, rent, it rents out its rooms in a flexible, uh, short-term time unit. Uh, the hotels are, uh, they're fun, they're enjoyable to be in, and they are, they help meet the needs in Japan, which is an overcrowded country, for privacy. The need for privacy in Japan must be great, as it's one of the biggest and fastest growing hotel sectors in the world. Most major international and domestic firms are steering well clear because of fears of its links with the underworld, but this company sees it as an opportunity. Four billion dollars in revenue industry that's completely untapped by the institutional market. And that's where we feel that we have the expertise to penetrate into this market and then provide a great uh, high yield product at a very reasonably low risk profile as well. Despite its seedy reputation, there's no doubt some love hotels, as they are commonly known in Japan, have given birth to some distinctive art and fashions. 
Not everyone likes it, but there must be some attraction. Regular Japanese hotels have a 70% occupancy rate, while, for example, the Chapel Coconuts in Fukuoka, southern Japan, averages an amazing 260%. It is a theme park hotel which attracts local tourists who come from across the southern island of Kyushu. Some tenants are Japanese, curious about these hotels designed specifically to lure people from the bedroom at home. Almost all rooms are fitted with karaoke machines and televisions. Some have chandeliers. But most of the customers using Japan's 17,000 love hotels are between 20 and 27 years old, many of whom continue to live with their parents because of high rents. Others live with extended family in homes with paper-thin walls and use love hotels to snatch a few moments of privacy. Part of the reason for the current financial boom in the sector is that many of the hotels were not well maintained and have now been renovated. It's the same situation in the regular hotel industry. But what is happening now is that we're re-offering to the market bad debt assets that we've been able to renovate, especially with property prices at rock bottom. Foreign investors see this and are especially keen to buy. At Japan's Love Hotel Trade Fair, most stalls were aimed at women's needs. Women are the ones who are most likely to control the decision about whether to go to a love hotel. It may not seem that way on the surface, but women are the ones that decide whether to go to a love hotel. And thus men take women to hotels they want to go to. So it's imperative that we build hotels that please women. One reason the hotels are popular is cost. A double room at a major hotel in Japan can run up to 30,000 yen, or 268 American dollars a night. But love hotel patrons pay on average one-tenth of that, as many of them rarely rent the room for a full evening. Patrons can rent rooms for as short as two hours. Love hotels have been around in Japan in one form or another since the 17th century. Many Japanese cities had specific areas set aside for what these days are called red light districts. They were traditionally areas where men of all classes could meet free of the social constraints of Japan's highly structured society. However, in contemporary Japan, where space and privacy are often at a premium, the new love hotel districts are blending in with the mainstream. Mention the name Wimbledon anywhere in the world and you will usually get the same response. Instant recognition that it is the home of tennis and perhaps the heart of England. The best way I can describe it is that rather than being like a big sporting event, it's almost like a, a garden party at which people are playing tennis. And while, you know, like any English person, I would struggle to define what Englishness is, I feel that at least I've experienced it having been here at the Championships. Although it moved to its present home in Church Street, Wimbledon in 1922, the All England Lawn Tennis and Croquet Club have been responsible for the championship since 1877. It is the oldest major championship in tennis and it remains the heart of the modern game. Only World War II has interrupted the annual tournament, so synonymous with the English summer, strawberries and cream. Over the 13-day tournament, both men's and ladies' singles tournaments are played simultaneously, as are doubles, mixed doubles and junior tournaments. To become a Wimbledon champion requires mastering a gruelling process. The men's draw begins with 128 players. The number halves after each knockout round is completed. The champion will have won seven successive matches against the sport's best. Yeah, this is probably the one tournament that you know, would have given anything to win, I think. Um, and, and to say that you've, you've won it once and to walk back here a year later is... Uh, you know, I think every year that I come back to play here, there's going to be special memory. Although money is not a problem for the top players of either sex, these days the players are competing for more than prestige and trophies. In 2007, 
the gentlemen's and women's singles winner each received £700,000. The money is the same for both sexes, but the lady single champion receives a sterling silver salva, the Venus Rosewater dish. The men compete for the same trophy awarded since 1887. Going to Wimbledon is a time-honoured tradition. The tournament will most likely retain its grass surface, making it the last major tournament to do so. Wimbledon is just one of four events that make up the famed Grand Slam. The others are the US and Australian Opens, which are played on hard court, and the French Open at Roland Garros in Paris, which is played on clay. To claim the Grand Slam, a player must win all four events in a single calendar year, a notoriously difficult thing to do. Britons are very proud of the tournament, although it is a source of national anguish and humour that no Englishman has won the singles event at Wimbledon since Fred Perry in 1936 and no Englishwoman since Virginia Wade in 1977. But before the battle begins, it's the workmen and mowers who take centre stage. They're cutting it as often as they can to try and get the, a, a greater density of growth. Um, but it's not like the lawn at home where you might cut it in one direction one day and one direction uh, three weeks later. It, it, it's, it's cut it crossways, lengthways and diagonally. It's, it's phenomenal and they comb it, they put sand in it, they fertilise it. They, they really do pamper the grass. The main show courts are normally used for two weeks a year during the championships but play can extend into a third week in exceptional circumstances. Rain is usually the cause, which is not exceptional, and the organisers are so used to rescheduling, the third week is rarely intruded upon. For those not able to attend Wimbledon fortnight, all is not lost. The club's museum has launched a guided tour that provides visitors with an authentic Wimbledon experience. The museum has one of the best collections in the world of tennis memorabilia ranging from clothes and equipment dating back to the 19th century. Modern items such as Anna Kornikova's dress, Boris Becker's battered shoes, and Bjorn Borg's instantly recognisable tennis gear. Visitors linger over the original Challenge Cups and remember the many battles lost and won here. See the Venus Rosewater dish, which is covered in figures from Greek mythology and review the best moments from great champions such as Pete Sampras, who won seven Wimbledon titles, his last in 2001. Now you can view the hallowed turf of Centre Court from the International Box and put yourself in the best seat in world tennis.